before I make my calls, I'm always looking at the old listing and figuring out how I'm going to be a mind reader. While I'm not talking bad about the other agent, I'm really punching them in the nose. Print off three or four houses oh. that closed during the time that your house was listed. There's a reason that those listings lived and flourished and yours died. It's going to be... I, I told him, I said, your job is not to sell the listing. Your job is... Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Ricky Carew! Ricky Carew from Gulf Shores, Alabama. I introduce you. He's number one, not top four. He's the man of the real estate industry. What's up, everybody? I have one of my favorite agents in the world, Mr. Shane Noblin out of North Carolina. What's up, dude? What's going on, man? How you been? I'm good, man. It's been a minute. Yeah, it has. It has. This summer has been crazy, so uh, hadn't been a lot of time for extra stuff. <laughs> yeah, man. Now, I always loved your uh, your listing stories and like your client. Uh, you go into depth on some of your your. Uh, you know your conversions and like things that happen so give me give me some give me some recent uh listing stories and deals oh wow all right well um so i picked up uh a i've been doing a lot more calling expireds and cancels this year i haven't okay. had last year i did almost exclusively fisbos this year uh, not as many fisbos have been hitting the market um and the conversion hadn't been quite as good i'm still getting them but just not as many, not enough to keep me busy for sure. So I've been really hitting the expireds and the cancels hard. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, those have been going well. I picked up one expired. It was a commercial property for one and a half million. And in my market, 300,000 is the midpoint. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm going in and meeting with these people um, or even on the phone, uh, there's a few different things that I like to like little catchphrases that I like to say to convert. Um, and one of those is really just two words this time. And while this time sounds very innocuous, it doesn't sound like much, right? When you use it properly, when you're talking to an expired or canceled, it's really a gut punch for um, the situation that they were in last time, right? Mm -hmm. And so in this case, uh, this lady had this property on for a year and it wouldn't sell at a million and a half. And uh, I reached out That's to her. Property. What's that? And this, this is a commercial property, you said? Yeah, it's a commercial land property in a really built up area of the state that's got a lot of construction going on and a lot of, of, of growth happening. And um, it, it was 20, 25, 26 acres right in the prime spot downtown, perfect for, you know, Walmart, uh, Kroger, whatever, one of those kinds of businesses. Mm. Um, and the other agent wasn't able to get it sold. And of course, not like my big thing is what's that other agent doing that uh, might be causing this not to happen. And so I'm always before I make my calls, I'm always looking at the old listing and figuring out how I'm going to be a mind reader. Right. Okay. While we can't say things about the other agent, I can't say, hey, your last agent did crappy photos. But what mm. I can say is, hey, I think what's really important in getting your property sold for the most money, you know, in the quickest amount of time is to have fantastic photos. I'm a drone pilot. I do all my own drone photography. That's a huge piece of it. Every one of my listings gets drone photography and professional quality photos. And what that does, it causes people to click on that little thumbnail on that whole list of properties that they're looking at. If they don't click on that thumbnail, which is, you know, that primary photo is what causes that then you're never going to get it sold. And ultimately, my goal is to make sure that this time you get a big win. Right. So I try to drop this time into conversations frequently through there. And while I'm not talking bad about the other agent, I'm really punching them in the nose. OK. Right? OK. It's it's, it's kind of a behind the scenes slap in the face. You know, last time you had the B team. This time you need the A team on your side. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot of stuff like that I've really been working on kind of the subliminal messaging in both my uh, calls with them and in the face to face conversations that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I'm frequently going down, uh, going down the like if I'm calling an expired and you're a big expired guy, that's how you built your business. If I remember right, that like cold calling, like circle prospecting and expires and cancels. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, I love hitting them with the question, uh, what happened on the last showing? Were you getting good feedback for the showings you did get? Okay. You know, for the last listing, what happened? Now, we know if it's expired or canceled, chances are they're going to say, I wasn't getting any feedback. Because what most agents out here in, 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 in our industry do is they love giving good news and they hate giving bad news. So they're like the ostrich with their head in the sand until they have something good to say. And I know what the answer is going to be more than likely when I ask that question. And it just gives me an opening to go into how I handle myself on giving feedback, scheduling showings, and the different things that I'm going to do to, mm -hmm. you know, potentially get this property to sell where it didn't the last time around. Mm. Um, like cold calling people in the neighborhood to see if they're looking to upgrade their property or right. cold calling people in the area to see if they want to pick their neighbor, right? I'm a, mm. I'm a big fan of deputizing everybody in the community to get your mm. property sold. Whereas most agents, put it on the MLS and just move on to the next thing and wait for the universe to bring them a buyer. Yeah. And so speaking to people this way really makes a big difference. And um, uh, back to the point that you had asked though, that million and a half dollar property, I got mm -hmm. it under contract within 30 days. Okay. And it was directly a result of old photos from the ground. I mean, if you think about it, 25 acres of farmland from the ground, okay. you're taking photos of corn and you can see okay. about 10 feet of it. And that's all yeah. you can see from 400 feet in the air and half a mile back. You get to see how it's positioned in the landscape, the fire station over here, the, the gas station, the different, you know, the banks and everything across the street. You get to see how the property is much better. And, and mm -hmm. really with the expires and cancels, what I found is just a lack of any kind of interest from the old agent to do it properly. So you don't think like the whoever the buyer is like who's the buyer who who like is it a grocery store is it a gas station what who's buying it so it's someone that is um going out and securing properties for businesses so they're in the process now of uh getting authorization from the county and there's a set of train tracks close by that they're going to have to come across so they're getting with the railway company to get that straight everything looks like it's moving pretty smoothly but they're either going to put a teeter harris or a kroger on this okay. property okay so i guess my question is is people like that i guess are they not trained to actually look past the pictures Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would I would I would absolutely think that they are trained to look past the pictures. Right. Um, and it could just be a timing thing more than anything okay. else. Right. Yeah. Like they were yeah. looking when I had the listing up versus when someone else has the listing up. Mm -hmm. I, people ask me all the time, you know, where do your listings come from? How do you get them? And I said, well, it's a combination of things. I'm cold calling people. I'm doing a weekly email vis-a-vis -vis Ricky Carruth. Right. Something I learned back in 2020. Um, I'm doing my follow-up system. When someone calls me and says, Hey, we're ready to list our property. I don't say, well, what caused that? And maybe I should start doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should start, uh, like finding out from them. What about me chose them to choose me? Yeah. But I don't, I just keep it moving. So it's the whole thing is the recipe to a good cake. And I'm not going to take any of the pieces out because I don't know which piece is going to cause the cake to fall. So you said you do you do find out why they picked you or I why don't. I should. Oh, you don't? Okay. Yeah, no, I never have before. I just move on, you know, get the information I need for the listing, go do great photography, get a good description up, you know, get the thing out there and then push it out as far as I can. But something I've started doing lately that's really been working out well, especially on expireds and canceled is while we're talking, right. And we kind of get through the whole beginning part of the conversation. I'll say, hey, look, now this is if it doesn't sound like I've got just an immediate opening for a listing appointment. I'll say, hey, look, I'll tell you what I'd like to do. If it's OK with you, I'd like to come by maybe this Thursday or Friday and do a real estate autopsy on your place. Real estate autopsy. A real estate autopsy. Now, this is something this is something right. I want to sound different from every other agent out there. And this is something that I teach the agents that come to me for coaching. We have to sound totally different. If there's 10 agents attempting to get this listing and they all sound identical, 
-hmm. then it's just going to be a race to the bottom. So we need to say things that are going to separate us from other agents in the community. And when I say something like a real real estate autopsy, they go, well, what the hell is that? And I go, well, an autopsy. I mean, you know what an autopsy is, right? Where somebody passed away, they're not sure what was the cause of death. And so they have a medical examiner look at that person and determine what caused him to die, right? And they go, yeah. And they go, well, your real estate listing was alive and well for six months this last year, from January 1st to June 30th, and it died. So what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, I'd like to stop by, and this is how I do it, right? I'll print off your listing, and then I'm going to go back from, let's say your listing was January 1st to June 30th. This is too much, man. What I'll do is I'll print off three or four houses oh. that closed during the time that your house was listed. So we're talking they're in the same market, okay. same number of bedrooms, same number of bathrooms, mm-hmm. same mm-hmm. year build, same size lot, as close as I can get to an apples to apples comparison, same school mm-hmm. district, whatever, as close as I can get to apples to apples. Because what happened is those three or four, they made it to a closing table while you were sitting there twiddling your thumbs waiting for an offer to come in. There's mm. a reason that those listings lived and flourished and yours died. Mm. And I'd like to sit down with you maybe Thursday or Friday and show you a side by side comparison that goes into what caused yours to die and what caused them to make it to the finish line. It mm. can be a range of things. What agents that have expired properties want to do is just say the market was too tough. Oh. Well, if the market was too tough, those homes that were exactly like yours made it to a closing table. Why wasn't it too tough for them? Uh-huh. Right. It's going to be price, features, marketing, photography, something. Something right. caused your house not to yeah. survive the sickness and those houses to, you know, move on, move on to their next thing or whatever. So I love doing these real estate autopsies. And the great thing is is that it doesn't even matter if you guys want to list with me or not. I like just meeting people, uh, getting in front uh-huh. of them, giving you more yeah. data. If it's something yeah. you decide you want to list, great. I can help you with that. And right. I have a lot of success in doing this. Oh, my gosh. that is. Dude, think about it from the perspective of that client. Are there That's any other crazy. agents saying this kind of crap to them? Wow. Do you find the most common, the commonality between the listings that die? is price no i mean sometimes it is Mm -hmm. sometimes Mm -hmm. the price is wrong but this is something else that i tell them look what a lot of you know people might do is they come in and they will try to wow you with this crazy price Mm -hmm. right to try and buy your listing and the problem with that is it sets it sets the expectation that that is a real number that you can get and so what their goal is, it's kind of like a little bait and switch thing. Their goal is to get you to list with them and then three months down the road, get you to reduce your price. Okay. I would rather come in when I come in and do a price valuation on a property. I don't care what sold in the neighborhood in the last six, eight, 12 months. That doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is who your competition is right now. Yeah. The active properties on the market that buyers are going to be choosing either that one or yours. Mm. Right. Because those are the ones that we have to beat to a finish line. Once I come up with a property value that makes you the logical choice based on either price or features out of the actives that are an apples to apples comparison to your house. Then I'll go back and look at sold properties to make sure once we get your house under contract, an appraiser is going to be able to justify the price. Mm. Right. But I really don't care about what's sold. And so what agents will do is they'll go to the sold properties from eight months ago, 10 months ago, 12 months ago. They'll tell you your house is worth 500,000 when really based on the other active homes in the market, like there's four that beat you in price and features. Mm. Well, now all of those are selling and you're sitting there waiting for yours to sell with an expectation that you can get 500,000 when really chances are you would be in a better position you would actually sell your house if it was closer to 450, 475, whatever that number is, Mm -hmm. that would be more realistic. And what it does for those knuckleheads that want to have theirs priced higher, well, you're giving them a real number. You're, you're, you're giving them a realistic, I can get this sold at this. And if they want to be at 500, 
hey, that's great. I'll list it wherever you want. I don't care about taking overpriced listings, but I'm setting the expectation from the very beginning where I think it's going to sell, where we do, where we would have the most success getting it sold quickly. And then I'm giving them the information that they need to do a price reduction when they want. Mm -hmm. Right. So if it goes yeah. a week and doesn't have any showings that Friday, I have a phone conversation with them. We, we go over how many times it was looked at on the MLS versus how many showings were set up, which we know is zero. Mm -hmm. And then we look at what came on the on the market as an mm -hmm. apples to apples comparison as their new competition and what closed off the market. Mm -hmm. Right. As an apples to apples comparison. So stuff like that that I'm doing, I really think it's a breath of fresh air. And I'm not getting, I don't necessarily close every deal, but, yeah. but I'm not losing people because I just sound like everybody else. Mm. I guess for agents listening, how do you bridge the gap between being realistic with what their price, what the property would sell for mm -hmm. based on real data and, and their urge to list with an agent that gives them a higher price? How do you make sure you don't lose? Because because you want to tell them the realistic price, but still ensure that, hey, I'll, I, you know, if you want to go higher, I'll do that. Here's the consequences of that. But I find that a lot of agents, um, you know, that are trying to learn the listing game, mm -hmm. they'll give the client the correct price, but then they'll lose the listing to an agent who gave them a higher price. How do you bridge that gap? So a couple of ways. One, I'm dealing with expired properties where they had a bad experience, where they weren't able to sell the first time. So I'm coming in there and giving them real world data. They've already been down the path mm -hmm. of going with an agent potentially that over promised and underperformed. OK, um, yeah. so that's one way. Another way, the night before my appointment with them, I'm sending them over those three or four active comps that I use for the price evaluation. I send it to them through my MLS. So that when they open it, I can see that they opened it. My MLS will notify me that they opened it and they look through. And I tell them in the notes section, hey, the, these are the active comps in your area that you are competing with to get to, to a closing table. The, these are the ones that are as close to an apple to apples comparison to yours as I could find. I'll be going over these tomorrow, but do me a favor. Look through the photos, look through the description, all that stuff tonight. So the night before, I've got them already formulating in their brain. OK, well, we're overpriced. We're this, we're that right before I even get there, because I want them to come up with this stuff before I even sit down and have a conversation with them. Uh -huh. then, when I'm, then when I'm sitting down having a conversation with them, I talk about the fact that, you know, the only thing I sell are for sale by owners, expires and cancels. I'd say that's 90 percent of my business, maybe a little more. And those are the hardest properties to sell because they've already been on the market in some form or fashion. You know, Fizbo's were on Zillow and then expireds and canceled were on on the MLS. And the problem that I see is that especially with these expireds and canceled, they sat on the market for, let's say, six months and they became stigmatized. Right. Because there was um, not enough being done to get them sold in as quick a time as possible, right? Whether it was unrealistic pricing, whatever. So now I have to overcome that, that obstacle, which is how to sell a stigmatized property, you know, the second time around. And this is how I do it. And these are the reasons that I see, like uh, I can show them on their property that, that, that didn't do well on the market. And you really have to walk a tight wire here. No, I'm kind of bouncing around. You can't talk bad about another agent ethically anywhere in the country, right? So you can't say, well, here's your listing. It had bad photos, right? But you have to come to an understanding with them that there's certain things ethically I can't do. I can't badmouth your old agent, that kind of thing. But I can tell you how I would do your listing, right? This, this listing that closed had great photography. I would do great photography on your house. I'm not bad mouthing the other agent, but I'm just saying between the lines, bad yeah, photography. Yeah, right. right. So um, that's really how I do it, you know. Yeah, uh, but like, but like, if if you give them a price, how mm -hmm. do you make sure they don't just go list with another agent? Like, what is there something you say as far as here's what the market is? 
you know, what do you think, get their response. And then based on that, maybe throw something else. If you feel like they could be like, well, I don't really care what the market is. I want this. Or are you yeah. saying that most of these people have already experienced that and the mo chances are they're not even looking to go with the highest agent anymore because they've already had a bad experience doing that the first time? I think a little bit of both. So if I get that pushback, right, that's fine. I'll say, hey, look, I'll list it there. And I have been, this is something that I'll say, I've been wrong in the past. I have come in here at like, without a doubt, I have come in here and gave a price and listed it for more than I thought we could sell it for and found mm -hmm. a buyer for more than we sold it for. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not, I'm not God. I'm not, I'm not beyond um, mistakes, right? I'm usually pretty close but we'll list wherever you like and you aren't going to find anybody that's going to work harder than I am to get your property sold. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if I'm getting that little bit of pushback, I'll hit them with that. And it usually goes over really well. I think it comes back too to the fact that you connected so deeply with them so quickly based on the fact that you proved to them that you're dependable and hardworking and consistent in relatively short period of time, but you did it in such a manner, they like know you're the real deal just based on your actions. So it's like they've decided they want to work with you. Right. And, you know, they know that you're the one they want to work with. I think that's the biggest part of this. A lot of agents feel like their listing presentation isn't up to snuff or they, um, you know. Do you have uh, a listing presentation? Because I don't. No, I've never, I've never done one. I've never, well, no, I did, I did two. I did two. When I, when right. I was, you know, I tried a lot of things right. and, and I had a listing presentation. I said, okay, I'm going to try this. And this was after like years and years. And this was after I was, you know, successful. I mean, right. I want to say, well, thinking back, I want to say, I don't know that I was to a hundred deals yet a year, but I was getting close when I did those two listing, listing presentations. And it was the most awkward thing in the world. Now I've seen listing presentations since then. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty good. You know, I can see that doing something like, so I know people that crush it with listening presentations yeah. and stuff. It's, it's not my thing. I'm more of a, I'm more of a people like I, like I want to, I want to fall back on my ability to connect with somebody on a level that nobody else, none of my competition can. I want to connect with them deeper than the rest of my competition. And I feel like that's, where I'm going to win. And that's where I won. That's where I ended up winning. And well, that's and what I talk about all the time. If you build rapport, if they like you, then you're going to get the listing. It doesn't, all of the bells and whistles and the, you know, hoopla doesn't, doesn't matter. Yeah. Get, get good at connecting with people on a personal level. So I'm getting, I'm getting messages now because there, there are markets where you're, there's still a few multiple offer situations happening mm -hmm. and stuff. Are you guys seeing multiple offers at all? My last house, the one I've got under contract now, or, or one of the ones I have under contract was a multiple offer situation. It's supposed to close yeah. next week. But most markets, it's, things are kind of sitting a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Due to prices are still at all time highs and interest rates are so high, even though they've come down a point. I think the biggest cloud over the industry right this second is the election. Mm -hmm. People kind of uh, wondering what's going to happen because it seems like there's a very stark difference in what the policies are going to be of each mm -hmm. candidate. Um, so things are kind of sitting on the market longer, right? So I've got agents reaching out to me saying, what do I do? How do I sell this property? It's priced right. It's priced within the comps. Uh, you know, I've done all this, I've done, done all that. Um, it's not getting much activity, you know, uh, how do I sell it? What do I do? Mm -hmm. uh, I know what, I know the answer I gave and I can tell you the answer I gave, but I want to hear what your answer would be to someone who says, Hey, this is sitting there. It's priced, right? It's not getting any activity. How do I sell it? Yeah. Well, I've had a few of those this year as well. I'll do an open house once a month on that property and I will advertise that. I'll put it on Facebook marketplace, uh, wherever I can put it. I'll also put it in MLS so that, you know, everybody that has saved it on any one of the platforms, they can see it and it comes in. 
not a huge fan of open houses. I don't, I don't get massive amounts of success from it, but I do get a lot of goodwill from my sellers because they see that I'm out there doing open house, you know, an open house in their property once a month. I also reach out to people in the neighborhood again, to deputize them to choose their neighbor. And the way that conversation goes is like, look, nobody wants that neighbor that's playing loud music all night that has junk cars in their front yard with the wheels taken off in the motor route and, you know, slinging drugs, whatever. If you know someone, right, that in the past has mentioned wanting to live closer to you, this would be a great place for you to put your cousin, the guy you went to high school with, whatever. And a lot of times just those conversations there, just prompting it with that sentence, it causes them to think about the Christmas party they were at last year and their cousin saying, hey, I'd love to move in closer to you. That thought had gone out of the front of their mind and it was back in the back somewhere that they weren't thinking about. So I get yeah. some success from that, um, but that's that's really about it. Really, it. I, I told him. I said, "Quit trying to sell it." Right. I said, "You know, your your seller may not care if it sells, like legitimately." Like, right. and and it kind of, I kind of thought about it for a second. Okay, what do I think the percentage of sellers who have their properties listed could care less if it sells or not? Dude, I just had one. I had one. We got a full price cash offer, seven day close. It had been sitting on the market for six months with crickets. Mm -hmm. We got a full price cash offer in seven days. The lady goes, well, no, I can't move in seven days. I said, well, how much time do you need? I'll talk to them and see if we could get it. And she goes, 30 days. I said, all right. So I went back to the buyer's agent and said, hey, we need 30 days. And she goes, yeah, great. I mean, we can do that. She'll find somewhere to stay. I went back to my lady. And said, all right, we got 30 days, cash deal, 30 day close, um, as is, no inspections, they're ready to go. And she goes, ah, what if I don't accept the offer? I mean, what do you mean? What if you don't accept the offer? I've done five, five open houses at your place looking for a buyer. This is a great deal. If, I mean, mm -hmm. if you're not interested in Which selling is, the what house. You're asking. Right. I said, if you're not interested in selling the house, we can just pull it off the market. Are you, are you yeah. no longer interested in that? She goes, well, not right now. I said, all right. So I, t I told the buyer's agent, thanks, but no thanks. Maybe, maybe on the next one. And we canceled the listing because over that time went from wanting to sell it to really not any longer. So why yeah. beat a divorce? Yeah. It's like, it's like that seller, you didn't even know that mm. they didn't really care for sales. You were under the impression that they wanted to sell it. Yeah. Um, but in the back of their mind, they didn't really care the way. And at the end of the day, they didn't want to sell. They didn't want to sell. But there's a lot of them that, you know, right. That they don't really care. It's like, well, you know, if I get this, mm -hmm. right, if I get this high price, you know, then I'll think about selling. Right. And then you list right. it and you got this property. The seller really doesn't care if it sells or not. And, yeah. and, and so when I'm talking to these agents, I'm like, well, your job is not to sell the listing. That's what we all think as agents, right? Our mm -hmm. job is to sell the listing, but it's not. Our job is to help our client do whatever it is the client is trying to do. So you got to understand what their objective and goals really are at the highest level, at the deepest level mm -hmm. in order to help them do it, which may or may not be to sell that property. They might right. just want it out there to see what happens or, you know, and it's good to understand that because if you're on one page and you're like aggressively trying to figure out how to sell this property, beating your head against the wall because it's 10, 20% overpriced, getting zero mm -hmm. showing and there's, and the seller won't come down and there's nothing you can do, but you're still like, wasting precious mental energy trying to figure out how to sell it. Yep. Um, and your seller is on another page, like, I don't care if it sells or not, then that's not a good thing. Like you got to get on the same page with your seller, completely on the same page about what we're doing, what the goals are. Yeah. You know, I'm going to do to service you to represent you at the highest level. Cause if you're aggressively trying to sell this property that isn't going to sell, our chances are very low. That's wasted energy. You could have spent stacking more listings mm -hmm. um, and you could actually leverage that listing to get other listings. Even if that listing doesn't sell, you can still right. use it while it's active. 
like you say, to call the neighborhood and try to find trade up sellers or neighbors that want to mm -hmm. find their own neighbors, et cetera, et cetera, to stir the pot. It's like, who cares if it sells? It's going to sell if it sells. It's, it's, it's not up to you. You right. know, like you said, we're not the real estate gods. Um, let that thing eat, man. <laughs> let that thing eat. And you go back and mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, but it, going back to your point about these listings dying, make sure it's got the greatest pictures, the greatest remarks that you're doing what you're supposed to do so that when that listing expires, it didn't die in your, it didn't die due to your hands. Right. Uh, you know, give the seller the feedback, call them every two weeks and give them that internal data of the feedback and showings and external data of the other listings around it. So they can make a decision of how they want to operate. That way, when the net, when you call them and say, "Hey, what was the feedback?" They can tell them, "Yeah, my agent gave well, me that's great." That's something feedback. else that I do, right? So on the feedback, when I ask that question, "Are are you getting feedback?" and they go, or I say, "What kind of feedback were you getting?" and they go, "Well, I wasn't getting feedback," right? I'll, that's my opportunity. That's an open door for me to audition for the job, and so I do that through storytelling, and I'll go, "Well." You know, on feedback, I think that's one of the most important things on getting a property to actually sell. Right. Um, it's certainly at least third on the list behind photos and a good description because the photos cause them to click on on the listing. The description causes them to call me and set up a showing. But the third thing is going to be the feedback. And so something that I do is when an agent reaches out to me to get feedback. I or excuse me, when an agent reaches out to me to get a showing. I'll call you, Mr. Seller, and confirm that we're good for Friday at four o'clock. And then I'll text that agent back and say, hey, we're all set for Friday at four o'clock. Here's the combination to get in and do me a huge favor. After the showing, shoot me over a quick text with some feedback I can pass on to the seller. So before the showing even occurs, I'm asking for feedback for it. Right. So in case that agent is not one that thinks about getting feedback and is, is like, oh, so it's not a good fit. OK. And they move on that conversation might prompt them to ask for feedback from their from their you know potential buyer. Mm -hmm. And then after the showing, one hour after the showing, if I have not received that text message yet, I send the agent another text message. Hey, really appreciate you showing it today. Hope the showing went well. When you have a minute, shoot me over a quick text with some feedback I can pass on to my sellers. So now I've asked for feedback twice, once before the showing, once one hour after the showing. If I don't get a response to that text message, I call the agent the next morning at 9 a.m. I'll call both their cell phone and their office line. If they don't answer, then I'll leave a voicemail saying the exact same thing. So Mr. Seller, here, here's what I do to make sure you get the best feedback so that whatever is causing them not to write on your property, we can potentially fix if it's something that's fixable. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I am asking three different times. If I don't call you the day of the showing to give you that feedback the next morning about 930, I'm going to call you no matter what. It might just be to say, hey, I've asked for it three times and I haven't got any feedback yet. When I get some, I will reach back out to you and let you know we're working hard to get another showing set up for you so we can get more people in there. Wow. My seller is never left in the dark. And I tell them the problem with agents that don't give feedback or don't communicate with you is that in the absence of any data, you plug in the worst possible data. Kind of like if your significant other goes out with her girlfriends or his, his buddies to a bar and is supposed to be home at 11 o'clock and it's now five o'clock the next morning and they're not home and they're not answering their phone and they're not act, uh, like responding to text messages, your mind is going to go to the worst place. It's going to go to they've been arrested. They've been in a car accident. They've hooked up with someone else. It's going to fill in the blanks with the worst possible thing. And where agents miss it is that when they fail to communicate, when they fail to get feedback, you as the seller, you're going to fill in that blank spot with the worst possible scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With me, you're damn near going to have to call me and tell me, yo, too much communication. Slow down mm -hmm. a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm not, that's just... I think it's critical. And that's how I talk to them on the phone during the conversation. This is serious uh, service. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that I've ever heard that somebody given that much service, right? Calling and texting the day after a showing every showing. To every get showing. Back. Yeah. So you've got, you said 10, 10 listings, five are pending. Mm -hmm. So you get five active listings. So you don't really have a lot. I mean, how many showings are you getting per week on your five listings? 
I don't know, um, two or three per listing. And I keep everything. Wow. I track so everything on a yellow like, legal pad. <laughs> so you got about 10 to 15 showings. I got about 10 to 15 that I'm pulling feedback on. So, so that's 10 to 15. So that's 10 to 15. Letting the agent know, send me some feedback. Then another mm -hmm. call to them to try to get the feedback. Then a call to the seller. All that for each showing. That's a lot. That's showing. a lot of work. It is. But once you get into a rhythm, like I've got my message saved in my um, on my clipboard on my phone. So mm -hmm. I use and I probably shouldn't, but I use the same combination for all for all my listings. It just makes I it did easier. too. Yeah, yeah I did too. so I use the same combination. So it's I don't respond to them by name. It's like, hey, really appreciate you setting okay. up the showing the combinations. Da 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 da. Right. Do me a huge favor, right? I've got that saved on my clipboard. So yeah, when yeah, I go yeah. To respond, I just paste yeah. that over, you and got, it goes you got over. a little bit of a system to it. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so. have you ever had sellers say? I don't need to know every no. single all they all love it. I say that as a joke. They all love it. Especially when you're talking expireds, cancels, even FISBOs. Um, <laughs> but expireds and cancels really because they're coming from a situation where they weren't getting that. So they, right, they just right, need it. Right. it. I would think that it really solidifies like a long term, lifelong, you know, business relationship yeah. when you do it like that. Yeah, because they're like, okay, I've never had this type of service. I'm, <laughs> I'm all in on Shane. I want to be different from everybody else out there. I mean, that's really yeah. when I'm sitting and thinking about my tactics and techniques and stuff. I am thinking about what everybody else does, and I'm thinking how I can do it different, more effective, fresh new, fresh new voice in a crowd of just the same old, same old. So you said three things. What was it? It was the pictures, the feedback. Pictures, feedback, uh, three things as far as what? Like things that I do different? I guess listing that you need, you know, that maybe the last agent didn't do so well. I can't remember what. It, I just remember you saying oh, one, two, so, three. Um, yeah, so marketing, you know, we can talk about our marketing versus. So pictures, you know, marketing, and feedback. Pictures, That's marketing, your, feedback. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then we talked a while back. Um, you've been in the business X amount of years. You had sold like 250 properties. Do you, do you know what your total is? I don't know what my total? total is. I sold a um, little over 50 properties last year. I sold uh, so far. I've sold 21 properties this year. I've got 10 listings right now. I've got five of those under contract. One closing tomorrow, one closing Monday. Um, and so then the other well over 300 properties sold. Yeah. Yeah, I've yeah, got two more listings years. coming on. Now, these two listings I've got coming this weekend, they're from a FISBO that I initially reached out to two years ago. Okay. Right back in, back at the end of 22, I initially reached out to him. It was a rental property and he, uh, he had it for sale by owner, kind of half-hearted, like you were talking about earlier. Not really serious, but if somebody gave him a crazy Ooh. amount for it, he would sell it. He reached out to me last week and um have you talked like what, what's been the communication since just the weekly email or what what's been the so the so the weekly email and once a month follow-up call so typically with my business i month. talk to him oh yeah 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 once a month because he had five rental properties and one and that he was trying two to years sell. of every month a call two years of every month a call holy how many people are on your monthly follow-up list uh, about 50. Okay. So the first and second of the month, I'll reach out to everybody on the monthly follow-up list. Okay. So the, so the call yep. session of on the first, the first day and second day of the month, those mm -hmm. call sessions are geared towards calling those 50 people to check in. Those and the cancels and expires, the new ones. Cause the first day of the month is kind of like a holiday for me. You get the biggest are you hand dialing these. Oh yeah. Everyone. Yeah, you have to. They're all like real numbers. It's not yeah. like so. Right. So to, so what's your pickup rate on the 50 since you're calling them every month? Right. And um, they know your number and stuff like that. It's pretty low. 
and it's I don't low. worry about the pickup rate being low, right? It's maybe 10, 15%. Course, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about time, right? Because like, right. because back when I would do things like this, I would call mm -hmm. past clients, right? So sometimes when I call past clients, I'd call like my top 50 or 100 clients. Well, they yeah. would all answer and they would all want to talk for 30 minutes because we knew each other and we, you right. know, we're, we were, you know, catching up on old times and properties mm -hmm. and families stuff like that. And so those calls, like I could not make, but like four calls an hour, literally. Right. Um, because of that. So I was just wondering. Um, so this is pretty low because they've already locked me in. We've already spoke several times. They, they know who I am. They know what I, I kind do. of see you as like a follow, like a salesman following up. And so, right. Most people so, generally ignore salesmen mm -hmm. who are following up if they're not interested in doing anything right then. They're just Until like, I don't really have time them. to talk. To That's right. Yeah. right. And it just keeps me top of mind. Me reaching yeah. out on the first. They see your name on their caller ID. So right. it's not like they hate you. That's not why they're not answering. They right. just don't have time to talk to you because they're not interested in buying right. or selling anything. But they know you. They they know you coming in. They know. They, they absolutely know what to do know. And remind me about they don't hate me uh, when I get done with this story because um, okay. I got another one I want to tell you about um, a hang up, a hang up that I converted. But anyway, with this particular guy, I'd been reaching out to him for two years. He called me last week, and um, of course I have him locked in my phone. I lock everybody in my phone. If I make a phone call to an expired and they don't answer the phone, I lock them in. Like, let's say you were the expired. It'd be Ricky as the first name, expired yeah. as the middle name, and whatever street they live on as the last name. So That's if you called me next year, I'd be like, hey, Ricky, how you doing? Even if we never spoke. That's what I did, too. And they'll say, do you remember me? And it's like, yeah, you had that expired property over on Johnson Street. <laughs> and then they feel good. They're like, holy yeah, they're like, wow. This, right? got this guy knows here. everything, right? So this particular guy reached out to me last week, and he's like, hey, Shane. I said, hey, um, Ricky had... His name's Ricky too. I said, Hey Ricky, how you doing? He goes, uh, not so good. I lost my mom yesterday. I'm like, Oh dude, I'm sorry to hear that. He started telling me about how she had got sick and then him and his brothers went over and they thought she was okay. They took her to the hospital, just kind of check in on her and, and make sure things were good. And then he went back to work and there's like a several day process. And then all of a sudden his brother called him and said, Hey, she's declining fast. You need to get here now. By the time he got there, she had passed away and the guy on the phone starts crying and all this other stuff. And I, and I just did the very best I could to be a good friend, right? Because we had kind of developed, we had spoke several times over the two years. It wasn't that he ignored every phone call I made. We spoke several times, uh, some of them lengthy conversations, but no business. And so, I did the good friend thing and, you know, kind of consoled him a little bit and talked to him a little bit about, you know, her and what her life was like and that kind of thing. Just, you know, doing what I could in the situation. And then before we got off the phone, um, I said a prayer with him and then hung up. He called me two days later and said, hey, I'm going to buy my siblings out on my mom's house. I need you to sell two of my rental properties. Can you can, how fast can you? get them listed and sold. I said, I can come out this weekend and do it. Right. So this weekend I'm going out. I've already got the two listing agreements done. I'm going out to do, uh, you know, photos and drone photography and all that, and I'll get them listed. But this is a two year relationship, right? That yeah. now I've got two deals from them and I'll get every deal from them from mm -hmm. here to all time. Right. Right. Because we've built so that level of every friendship. month, Paul, you continue mm -hmm. every month. Now that you've done these deals, do you feel like the every month call is necessary now or does the power of your service of the deals lock you in for life where now the weekly email could kind of carry yeah. the relationship? Are you going yeah. to continue yeah. the monthly calls? You're going to take them I off won't. that list and replace that with. With someone else that I'm looking to lock in as well. Or literally oh people God. you haven't done business with yet mm -hmm. that you just feel like I need to call this. I need to stay in touch with this one. Yeah. How do you how do you decipher the 50? Cause I'm sure there are more than 50 people you've called that you've connected with that have properties that would be great clients that you would want. How do you, is it just because you can only handle 50 monthly calls to keep up with? So you just kind of try to pick them out somehow. Is it random? It really kind of depends on several factors, like depends on the house. You know, if it's a, 
ten thousand dollar building lot i'm not i'm not reaching like you just reach out to me i'll put you in my weekly email you reach out to me when you're ready and it's also going to depend on what the last conversation with them was like right whether they you know yeah we're going to do something next year it's like okay well i'll keep in touch with you um you know maybe around the first of each month if you guys need anything or any questions pop up lock my number in be more than happy to talk with you about it <clears throat> right and so it's somebody that's expressed some sort of an interest of selling, selling their really property good. at some point in the future it yeah. is typically the ones that i'll plug in there and just keep on with the follow-up yeah so tell me about this uh they don't hate you story oh the hang-up call so i was calling an expired property now you've made a lot of calls i've made a lot of calls i'm in a zoom room every day for 10 hours listening to agents make calls what happens when someone hangs up on most agents? They call them right back and they go, hey, we must have got disconnected. I'm not sure what happened, but what I was trying to say was, and they go right into what they were trying to say. So I'm shooting a recording. I've got this on my YouTube channel. I'm shooting a recording of this particular call. The guy picks up the phone and I was like, hey, Jim, he goes, yeah. I said, hey, this is Shane, local real estate agent. I saw your property expired off the market over on Creek Trail. Whatever happened with that? He goes, Shane, now's not a good time. Um, I'm going to have to let you go. And I started to say, because typically what I'll do there is say, what's a better time we can talk? I don't want to say my piece real fast. I don't mm -hmm. want to say, well, I'll only be a minute because I don't want to have just a minute conversation. I want to have a long conversation. I want to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I always say, what's a better time we can talk? And I'll call you back. I was in the middle of saying that and he hung up on me. Click. And what most of us do is, oh no, he's not going to hang up on me is pick the phone up and they call him right back. Um, what I realized, and maybe not necessarily in that moment, but that moment I was like, well, let's, let's try something different here. He hung up. It's a dead call. I shot him a text message. Sorry, I called during your family time. Is there a better time that we could chat? And he goes, yes, thank you for understanding next week. And I said, okay, I'll reach out to you on Monday. Right. I valued the fact that I'm cold calling him. I have no idea what I'm interrupting, no idea what he's right in the middle of. And people can just be busy. It's not necessarily that he's being a jerk. It could just be that he's too busy. He did answer the phone because he didn't know who it was. He wanted to see who it was. If it was something hyper important for him. But at that moment in time, I was not hyper important, but he still right. was interested in talking to me. I called him the following Monday. I captured that on video as well. Then I went to the appointment on Tuesday and after the appointment did a little, a little uh, uh, video segment of me getting ready to do my photos and everything, picked up the listing from a hang up call. And that guy's my client for life. I have since got that house sold and he's moved on to other things. And we talk yeah. pretty frequently. Like he calls me every once in a while just to see what's going on how I'm doing. I've been golfing with him, all that kind of good stuff. So um, I think it's important to understand that we have to separate our feelings from this, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Because it's too easy yeah. to go like, oh, I can't believe they hung up on me. Right. You know, what an asshole. <laughs> and is, they don't know you. Right. Right. Like if they saw you in Walmart, they would not, you would not know who they were. They wouldn't know who you were. They do not know your intentions. They know nothing about you whatsoever. They didn't Google How you. They didn't look at reviews. They didn't pick you. You're trying nothing. to pick them. Right. right. Nothing. It's like, how can you How can you care at all with this person right. that literally knows nothing about you? Exactly. Thinks about you in any capacity, right? Yep. Cool, man. Well, we're we're going to end it with that. I got to head to my next meeting, bro. Such a pleasure to uh, to have you on once again and spend some more time with you, man. Thanks for sharing with everybody. Absolutely, brother. Hope you hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, man. You guys go follow Shane on YouTube. I'll put his channel in the description below. And until then, we'll see you guys on the next video. Keep selling. See you guys.